Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, the Indo-Pacific, and the fate of the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, and today we are honored to be joined by the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel J. Crittenbrink, Dan to his friends. Uh, Dan Crittenbrink previously served as the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam from 2017 to 2021. He was also Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council and Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, in addition to multiple other overseas tours, mostly in Asia, though in other places as well. Uh, Dan is a Nebraska native, uh, and he has a master's from the University of Virginia and a bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska at Kearney. So, Assistant Secretary Dan Crittenbrink, welcome to the Pacific Century. Dr. Oslin, Misha, what an honor to be with you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, to think big thoughts here uh, well, on this Tuesday morning. You've come to the wrong place for big thoughts. I mean, we, we, we might be able to squeeze out some very small thoughts, but it is a busy week and uh, I particularly appreciate you coming uh, with everything going on. So let's let's launch into it. We've got a whole host of stuff to talk about that. You are uh, probably the best placed person in the government to uh, to work with us on. So number one. Well, I don't know about that. Let me just say honor to be with you this morning. And it's a tremendous honor to have this uh, this position. I'm a career foreign service officer, as you know, and to be able to uh, you know, work in a, in a position to help shape and implement our, our policy and our strategies in the Indo-Pacific is truly the honor of a lifetime. Look forward to our conversation today. Well, thanks again. And, and again, someone with your with your depth and breadth of experience, really, to, to be able to talk about all the things that are happening, including uh, a raft of new leaders in the Indo-Pacific. And that's where I'd like to Great start. Point. Sure. So we just had an election in the Philippines, a very important election. Yes. The new president will be Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who goes by Bong Bong. So Bong Bong Marcos, um, if you are of a certain age, like me when I was in college, you remember and watched on TV the overthrow of his father, Ferdinand Marcos, the dictator. Uh, that was in 1986. Uh, obviously, we have had a fraught relationship with the Philippines under current president Duterte. Um, president to be president elect Marcos actually was running under or with Duterte's party. So he is a member of Duterte's party, but he is, of course, the scion of the Marcos dynasty. So um, what do we expect from uh, the new president, President Marcos, and, and how will that affect our alliance? And will he be as focused or as leaning towards China as it seemed that President Duterte was? Well, Misha, thank you. Let, let me start by saying, um, when I try to summarize Biden-Harris uh, administration's uh, approach to the Indo-Pacific, I usually uh, describe it by using just one phrase, allies, partners, and friends, because I think um, building the collective capacity of our allies and partners in the region, uh, ensuring that we um, work together with allies and partners to defend the rules-based order, which we believe is uh, is currently under threat, really is the, the, the center of our entire approach to the region. So uh, our five treaty allies uh, really are our primary focus in the region, and certainly the Philippines is one of our key treaty allies. Uh, again, it, it is a, a true point of emphasis for us in the region. Um, we welcome uh, the election of uh, President-elect Marcos. I think you may have seen on May 11 that President Biden uh, spoke to him. I believe President Biden was the first world leader uh, to call President-elect Marcos. Uh, my understanding is they had a, a very productive, very positive conversation. The president stated how much he looks forward to working with President-elect Marcos to continue to strengthen and build out our, our vitally important alliance. We think, again, our alliance is uh, with Philippines and with our other four allies in the region really are irreplaceable and foundational. So I think we're optimistic for the future. Um, uh, we do want to give uh, the new president-elect some space to actually be inaugurated and, and begin, and we look forward to continuing to work 
uh, over these final weeks with President Duterte and his team. But uh, look, I would just say, Misha, that um, we continue to cooperate very, very closely with our Filipino allies on a whole range of issues, certainly particularly on security issues and maritime issues in the South China Sea, where we have longstanding shared concerns about uh, PRC assertiveness and aggressiveness and their unlawful claims there. But look, we, we've we been uh, friends, partners, and allies for decades, and I think we'll continue to build on that history and our shared values. And again, look forward to working with, uh, with the president-elect. Is he a populist like Duterte is? Meaning, do you have worries? Obviously, the um, relations between the U.S. and the Philippines started getting difficult. That's a diplomatic way to put it. They started getting difficult under the Obama administration. Um, uh, There were ups and downs during the Trump administration. Of course, you were out in the region as ambassador to Vietnam at that time, so you probably saw it a little bit more closely than others. Um, Is he a populist? Are we we worried that these policies are going to continue, or, or will that create problems for us? Well, uh, again, Misha, I I, want to give the president-elect all all of the space to uh, uh, determine uh, exactly how he wants to approach matters. Here's what I'm confident of. I'm confident that our alliance with the Philippines is enduring. Uh, I'm confident that our many shared interests and values and and our shared uh, history is going to continue to propel. Uh, our relationship forward. So again, we're, we're very optimistic about the future and we look forward to working with the president-elect and his team. And I would say, look, even, even over uh, the last several years, sure, there have been uh, challenges, but we've also done many great things uh, together. And I think the cooperation that's at the center of, alliance, uh, of our alliance has continued um, uh, for the last uh, few years and has really intensified over, over the last uh, couple of years. So we look forward to continuing that trend and that momentum. Uh, but I, I can guarantee you we're going to continue to place tremendous emphasis on our alliance with the Philippines. We have great respect for our Filipino friends. Um, channels of communication uh, are open, uh, very close and, and active. And so, uh, again, we're quite optimistic uh, about the future. And one last Philippines question before we move on. Um, Uh, Obviously, under Duterte, um, the Philippines was moving closer to China at at certain times. There was obviously a lot of tension in that relationship, and yet there would be moments of of what seemed uh, like a a very close uh, close, uh, alignment. Um, Early readouts, do you get any sense on on where President-elect Marcos will go? Will he continue? uh, Will he be pro-China? Will he continue a pro-China tilt? Do we have confidence that we're going to, you know, that the our alliance will become primary in Philippine foreign policy? Well, Misha, here, here's what I'm confident of. I'm confident uh, of the fact that our uh, Filipino allies will know best how to determine their national interests. Uh, I'm also confident that the United States of America is going to continue uh, to be uh, the Philippines' reliable, consistent, strong, and dependable ally and partner. There's no doubt about that. Uh, It's one of the reasons why the president wanted to call President like Marcos uh, so uh, early just to make that clear. And and I think from that perspective, again, uh, I remain quite uh, optimistic about the future. Um, We we always say that we don't ask our partners in the region, uh, even our closest allies to quote unquote choose. You know, you have to deal only with the United States, you have to deal only with China. That's not what we're about. That's not the Um, the position that we want to put our partners in. Rather, what we want to do is we want to make clear what we proactively and affirmatively stand for. Uh, And then we also want to continue to build the capacity of our partners, including our Filipino allies, uh, to be able to make their own sovereign decisions free of coercion uh, and to advance their national interest in the way uh, that they see fit. I'm quite confident in that approach. uh, And I'm I'm quite confident uh, going forward that uh, allies like the Philippines and other partners in the region, uh, they, they're sending a very strong demand signal for U.S. engagement. In fact, I would argue for increased U.S. engagement. Uh, and I think uh, partners in the region, they, they have their own important complex relationships with China, and that's fine, but they also have deep concerns. And certainly, uh, I would say one of our primary concerns, one of the issues we're tracking most closely, is China's ongoing aggressive behavior in the South China Sea, including uh, behavior and claims, many of which are uh, unle- illegal and have no basis in international law. Uh, and uh, that's something I think that we see eye to eye uh, on with our 
Filipino friends. So let's shift north a little bit to maybe uh, sure. uh, an easier ally. I know, I know you wouldn't say that, but you know that's the difference, by the way. I mean, the optimism and the confidence of a professional diplomat like yourself versus the eternal pessimism of a historian like me. I like the balance. You balance <laughs> us out here on the podcast. It's really important. Well, uh, should, no, I appreciate it. Look, <laughs> one of the reasons why I wanted to spend some time with you is, and I mean this very sincerely, look, we, we really benefit from these conversations. And when we have uh, world-class experts like yourself, whether it's in academia or the media, um, you know, it's great that you keep us honest, that you force us to think, see things from a new angle. So no, I, I have tremendous respect for, for you and what you do. And I appreciate the conversation, but yeah, I, I hope my confidence and optimism shows through. Um, I, I have, uh, look, I have tremendous confidence that, uh, in the long run, when you think about who we are as Americans, what we stand for, the values and the principles and the interests that we stand for, the capabilities that we have uh, buttressed by our long history of association with our allies, partners, and friends across the region. Uh, I'm, I'm quite confident and op optimistic how this is going to turn out. And, and the reason why we're so focused on it, if I can add, Misha, is we are absolutely convinced, and the president has made clear, that uh, America's future security and prosperity is going to be dependent on what happens in the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's really that simple. We think that the history of the 21st century is largely gonna be written in the Indo-Pacific. We have to get this right. Uh, it's in our national interest. It's in the interest of the American people. And, uh, but again, I have great confidence and optimism about uh, our approach and how that's gonna work out. Well, it's 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 great uh, again to hear you to say it. I, you're you're too kind, by the way. Uh, regular listeners of this podcast will be thinking, "Who is he talking about?" Because there's there's no expert here that that's that's moderating this. You're the expert, so let's move north a little bit and actually to another sure. ally, one that in uh, in some ways uh, I, I don't want to say closer, but one that we have almost a unique. Uh, alliance relationship with, and that of course is South Korea, who, which also has a new president, a president elect will be, have a president, uh, I believe in May. Um, and that is President Yoon. Uh, president Yoon is, is a political novice, uh, was a prosecutor, never ran for political office before, is not a career politician. Um, he is on the conservative side of the spectrum. He had very narrow victory, extremely narrow victory. Some, some things of like what we're getting used to here in the States of a very divided electorate, but he has signaled very strongly his interest in uh, improving relations with Japan, which is critical for us, uh, also improving relations with us, uh, and, uh, and a somewhat maybe a more open question on where he'll go with North Korea. So what can you tell us about what we should be expecting, what we're hoping, and what the Biden administration is hoping from President, soon-to-be President Yoon in South Korea? Well, Misha, thank you very much. And, and if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah, President Yoon, of course, uh, uh, won the, the South Korean election and was just uh, just inaugurated. Uh, the second gentleman uh, led the U.S. Uh, delegation to the inauguration. And I know that, oh. uh, you know, President Biden is, is very much looking forward to his trip. Uh, to the region in coming days. Uh, I think you've seen the announcement the president will be in, in Seoul and Tokyo, and I, I, I won't get ahead of the White House and what further uh, the president and national security advisor and others will say about the trip, but I, I do know how much the president is looking forward to that. And, and here is, is another place, Misha, where I would say we, we really have you know, no, no better or no closer ally than the Republic of Korea. You, you think about the, uh, again, the enduring strength of our alliance ties, um, uh, really born, you know, in the crucible of, of, of war um, and continuing all these many decades. And you look, uh, for example, uh, last year when then President Moon Jae-in came to the United States as the second world leader to visit President Biden in the White House. You look at the joint vision statement that we released at this time. It's really stunning in terms of the breadth and depth of the issues on which the United States and the Republic of Korea are aligned uh, and, and that we're working on for our benefit and the benefit of peoples in the region and the world. And I think what we anticipate, Misha, is that um, that momentum will only continue uh, under President Yoon, and, and I'm quite optimistic that here again, our alliance with the Republic of Korea will only further strengthen uh, and deepen. You know, I, I had, again, one of the reasons why it's such a privilege to have this job, I had the honor of traveling out to Seoul 
uh, last fall for my first trip to the region as assistant secretary. I believe it was in October. Um, but whenever it was, I, I had the honor of meeting uh, both the presidential candidates at the time, including then presidential candidate Yoon, and he was kind enough to, to spend some time with me. And I came away uh, deeply impressed. I think what what he said to me in that meeting and what you saw in the campaign and what he said since his election and inauguration is that this uh, is a leader who's firmly committed uh, to the USROK Alliance. Uh, I think we've been quite impressed by um, his stated desire, again, to work closely with the United States, not just on uh, Korean Peninsula issues, but on issues related uh, to the broader region and globally. And then uh, we're quite hopeful as well, as you noted, uh, I think he's already had some significant outreach to Prime Minister Kishida in Japan and has stated his desire to make progress there. And so we're, we're quite uh, hopeful about that as well. I mean, in, in a nutshell, the United States of America and the American people are more uh, secure and prosperous when our two closest treaty allies uh, in Northeast Asia have a productive working relationship. And so uh, we're hopeful there uh, as well. Um, I would also add that um, the new uh, South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin uh, led a delegation here prior to the inauguration and um, uh, I and others here in Washington had a chance to sit down and have extensive conversations him as well, uh, with him as well. So let, let me just reiterate, very hopeful uh, very optimistic about um, our future cooperation with the Republic of Korea. Maybe a final point. Um, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about uh, quote unquote global Korea and uh, been quite struck by that. Korea has a lot to offer, not just to the United States, but to the region and the world. And we're very supportive uh, of seeing Korea play that, um, that very important role regionally and globally as well. Yeah, so we obviously, uh, I have to do an editorial note, which uh, I always have to do on this podcast. I actually forgot it was May, honestly. I, I, I knew he was getting inaugurated in May. I forgot. Uh, it was I know. May. I know exactly what it's like to be in the vortex when you get in, in work. Yeah, no, uh, really, it was, it was quite exciting that uh, the second gentleman and and that was uh, a week ago. It was uh, May 10th. Secretary of Labor. I think that was a week ago. Yeah. yeah. And uh, somebody from my team as well went Great. out there and again came back very impressed uh, by the new new president. And um, but but again, uh, I think the point I'm trying to make is that our alliance with the Republic of Korea is enduring, uh, transcends politics in any one party. We, of course, uh, uh, had a very productive uh, relationship with uh, uh, former President Moon Jae-in. But uh, but again, we're off to a fantastic start with President Yoon, very optimistic, very confident about uh, our future work together. And I think uh, that will come through loud and clear during uh, President Biden's uh, trip in just the next few days. Right. So he, so the president is going. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense on uh, what would we believe new President Yoon is, uh, what is North Korea policy is going to be? Obviously, former President Moon uh, pushed, you know, a, a really a sort of unprecedented engagement, both between the North and the South, but also to, in many ways, push the United States into high-level direct uh, negotiations that took place under the Trump administration with the North. Um, is there more hesitancy that that you think uh, is coming from the U? Not, I don't want to say hesitancy and they're brand new, but what, what are you reading from how they're going to approach North Korea, which has been conducting uh, more rocket tests lately? Um, they seem to be popping up a little bit more. Of course, now there seems to be a COVID outbreak. Uh, so the, it, it's a tense time on the peninsula. How? What's your assessment of where Yoon is going to go with North Korea? Sure. Well, no, thank you, Michelle. Look, I, I, I don't want to speak uh, for the President Yoon administration. I would just say that um, among all the many issues that we discuss and on which we cooperate closely with our uh, Korean allies, obviously North Korea is, is one of the most important. <clears throat> um, and that's been the case for decades. And, you know, I say, unfortunately, that will have to be the case going forward because I think the situation uh, in the North um, is deeply concerning and, and uh, is only becoming more so. Uh, I think Washington and Seoul, and I know this is the case under President Yoon as well, we are deeply concerned uh, about the uh, multiple uh, missile launches and tests that we've seen this year. Uh, we're concerned that North Korea may take uh, other destabilizing steps. We continue to signal um, 
first and foremost are ironclad security guarantees to our treaty allies, the Republic of Korea and Japan. We've made clear that we will continue to take steps to counter the threat posed by North Korea's missile uh, and, and nuclear programs. Uh, but we've also signaled uh, that we are, um, we are open uh, to diplomacy um, to explore a, a better path uh, uh, forward. Um, but of course, to date, uh, North Korea has signaled no, no willingness to explore that path uh, with us. So we'll continue to take steps. We'll remain in lockstep with uh, our Korean and Japanese allies and others, but we'll continue to take steps um, uh, to counter the threat, again, uh, posed by North Korea. And uh, our friends in Seoul and Tokyo and elsewhere in the region should have no doubt uh, about that. So in, in the interest of time, I mean, I'd love to talk more about uh, about Korea, um, but in the interest of time, let's jump down south because we have yet another potential leadership change, and that's also with a critical ally, and that's going to be in Australia. Australia is having sure. an election this week. Sure. Um, the current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, of the Liberal Party, that's the Conservatives in Australia, is trailing in the polls, so seems to be solidifying his position a little bit. Um, and the um, Labor Party, a more progressive, the Labor Party um, uh, candidate, uh, is uh, has the potential of, um, uh, of winning. So what would be uh, the implications, do you think? How, how you know, what's your sense? Do you, do you think the uh, Prime Minister Morrison is going to carry uh, pull it out, or do you think um, uh, we're going to see a new uh, potentially progressive uh, leadership in Australia? And what will that mean for our alliance? And what will it mean for the Quad? We're going to talk a little bit more about the Quad later. Sure. Well, uh, Misha, I, I, I don't know and um, not in the business of trying to predict uh, elections, whether it's uh, in Australia or anywhere else, but I, I would note uh, it's really encouraging to me that we're having this conversation about some of our closest treaty allies in the region, and and they're all coming out of democratic elections. And I think it it just speaks to you know why is it that these countries are are among our, our closest allies and partners because we share not just interests and a history together, but we share uh, obviously many important values, including our commitment to democracy. Look, when when I talk with our Australian friends, I had the chance just yesterday to talk to my uh, Australian counterpart. Uh, I noted to them that. Uh, you know the the upcoming election, which is really a celebration of of Australian democracy, is something that uh, we're watching closely. But we've made very clear that our alliance with Australia uh, transcends politics in any one party. We very much look forward uh, to working closely with whomever uh, the Australian people select, and we're confident uh, that whomever the Australian people uh, select, that again our alliance will endure. And we'll continue to work closely to advance our shared interests and values with uh, with our Australian partners going forward. Uh, I would note that um, in February, had the honor of traveling with uh, Secretary Blinken uh, to Australia. It was part of a larger trip to the region, and we went there for uh, uh, the the Quad Foreign Ministerial uh, that Secretary Blinken uh, participated in, and that our RLC allies hosted. And it was a tremendous honor to be there. Uh, highlighted not just the strength of the quad, but really bilaterally as well, the the enduring strength of our uh, alliance with Australia. No better ally, no better friend. We fought shoulder to shoulder in every conflict over the last century. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary just how uh, aligned we are strategically uh, and in terms of our interests uh, and values. And while we were there, of course, we had fantastic meetings uh, with uh, with. Uh, with the Prime Minister, uh, with Prime Minister Morrison, with Foreign Minister Payne and others. But as we always do when we visit our democratic partners around uh, uh, the region, we had a chance to meet with the opposition as well. And, and again, we, we came away uh, impressed and, and confident that uh, no matter who wins this election, uh, the US-Australia alliance will endure and strengthen going forward. It'll be very interesting to um... Uh, to see what happens, obviously, if 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 there is a change in in government, if that will indicate also a change uh, in uh, policy or relations with China, which for Australia has been extremely difficult over the past uh, several years, and and I would uh, probably expect not, but uh, but it'll be uh, interesting to see. Um, yeah, sure. The, the one thing I mm -hmm. would say, and again, the reason why we you know why why I said what I said just a moment ago is is through the meetings that we had both with. Uh, the current government and opposition leader Albanese and the shadow foreign minister uh, Wong and others. You know, I think we came away confident that uh, whomever the Australian people uh, select, uh, you know, uh, all sides are committed to the alliance and and to working uh, closely together to continue to advance our shared interests. And, and certainly China will be 
uh, I would argue foremost amongst them. We'll let our Australian friends speak for themselves. But there's no doubt that um, amongst the concerns that we have with PRC behavior, it's the the use of coercion to advance, uh, you know, on the part of Beijing to advance its national interests as it defines them, that I think is probably most concerning to us and many of our partners. And certainly Australia has been subject to that, but so have many other partners and friends uh, around the region. It's, it's deeply concerning. So let's talk about, uh, if we're talking about coercion and we're talking about China, um, then perhaps at the top of the list is Taiwan. Um, last week, the uh, State Department released a fact sheet. For those who are not familiar uh, with the fact sheets, they are sort of a, a, a general but but top level statement of uh, the, the the U.S. policy and and how the U.S. views any particular country. I don't know if we do fact sheets for every single country, but we obviously do them for critical countries and, and our, our critical yeah, I think, allies. I think we do, uh, we do fact sheets on, uh, on just about every, uh, every partner with whom we have a, a relationship. Out there. So we had, so one was released last week on Taiwan and it was significant. It was different. Uh, it was different from uh, prior fact sheets, including those uh, that, that the, the Trump administration had put out. Uh, and it was unabashed in its uh, support for the relationship uh, with Taiwan, the role that Taiwan plays as a critical partner for the U.S. It changed some of the language. Uh, it dropped a line that had been in there for a long time on the U.S. opposing Taiwanese independence. Uh, it dropped the line that uh, the, the, the common phrase that we've used for a long time, the U.S. recognizes China's position that there is one government of China. Instead, it simply reiterated the agreements that we have made, such as the um, uh, the, the three communiques, the six assurances, and the like. So can you tell us a little bit about what what's changed now? What How has this become such a, a sort of vocally forthright approach towards Taiwan? What has the Chinese response been? And, and was there any opposition inside government to changing the fact sheet so dramatically? Well, uh, Misha, thanks, thanks for this question as well. Always delighted to have an opportunity to talk about uh, Taiwan and, and cross-strait issues. I, I think the first point that I should uh, emphasize, I know there, there was some uh, some press coverage of uh, of this issue. Look, there's there's been absolutely no change to America's one China policy, and again, it's our U.S. one China policy, which is of course different from uh, the PRC's one China principle. And America's longstanding one China policy is is based on the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, and the six assurances to Taiwan. So nothing has changed uh, about that. Uh, if you go back and you look at uh, the testimony uh, that I delivered together with my good friend, Assistant Secretary of Defense Eli Ratner, last fall in front of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, or if you you think back to uh, the separate uh, closed door briefing that we gave to the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee on this same subject earlier this year, we've made clear that there's been no change to America's one China policy. There's been no change to uh, the framework that we use to approach and, and manage these issues. Uh, I think we have all the tools that we need. The, uh, our focus needs to be uh, continuing to meet our obligations uh, under the Taiwan Relations Act, which, as you know, Misha, um, states that the United States will ensure uh, that Taiwan is able to maintain a sufficient self-defense uh, capability. So our focus is on deterrence. It's on uh, stability. It's, it's on peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, maintenance of the, uh, the status quo uh, across the Strait. And I would argue that it's our approach and these policies that have helped us maintain peace and stability uh, across the Strait uh, for, for the last 50 years. What has changed and what is deeply concerning um, is a host of, of Chinese actions designed to uh, put pressure uh, on Taiwan. And uh, those are the actions that I would focus on and would ask you and other friends to focus on. Uh, that's what is concerning uh, to us. But there's been no change uh, to our formal one China policy in any way. Uh, the fact sheet was uh, updated and we do that uh, periodically, but 
um, again, there's been no no change to our fundamental one China policy. Oh, I think that makes sense. It it does, and I, I think for those uh, who support Taiwan, which you know certainly most of the people that I know uh, in D.C. and most of the folks working on Asia, um, not only welcome the fact sheet uh, and were were heartened by it, but it 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 seems I think to many that the the administration is taking some significant steps to norm even more the idea of Taiwan being a, a player and an actor uh, in the region and, and, and beyond the region. I think that may have started in some ways with um, the COVID uh, pandemic when we saw how well that the Taiwanese dealt with it and, and, and how open they were and uh, supportive of, of international, uh, the, the international institutions that worked. Um, uh, but even before that, there had been uh, moves, obviously, a lot of moves by the Trump administration, starting with the the, the phone call between uh, then President Elect Trump and uh, President Tsai Ing Wen of of Taiwan, uh, the first ever. Um, but even beyond that, it seems that the the, the U.S. And, and the administration now is is pushing for Taiwan to be more uh, more normalized as a part of the international community. Is that a fair assessment? And it, and if so, uh, what's next? You know, what is it getting it yeah. into the WHO? Is it getting it into uh, Red Cross? I mean, what, what what would you like to see? Yeah, Misha, I guess what I would say is, again, I'll just reiterate a bit of what I said before and then respond more directly to what you said. Again, what is our focus? Our focus is on uh, cross-strait peace and stability. It's on maintenance of that status quo that we would argue has maintained peace and stability for decades. And, and it's, again, continuing to focus uh, our policy, as we always have, on um, making sure we're assisting Taiwan to maintain that sufficient self-defense uh, capacity. So our, uh, our relationship with Taiwan is an unofficial one. But it's a very important, I would say vitally important, and very robust one. Uh, Taiwan is a tremendous democratic partner. It has a lot to offer to the region and to the world. And I think that is something that we have, uh, that we probably have highlighted uh, a, a bit more. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think that, again, that doesn't, um, that doesn't signify uh, any change in our uh, official approach uh, to these issues. I think it signifies uh, really the extent to which uh, Taiwan has developed its capabilities and proven, uh, as you noted, whether it's in the, in the medical field or, or, or other fields, or quite frankly, its central role in the global economy, uh, that Taiwan has demonstrated what an, what an important partner uh, it is. So we are focused on that. We do talk about making sure that we are able to expand and uh, maintain Taiwan's so-called international space so that Taiwan can play a productive role uh, in the international community. And our position is that, um, you know, Taiwan should have uh, a productive role uh, in, in uh, should have a formal role in organizations that don't require statehood. And, and in those that do, uh, Taiwan should still be able uh, to play a, a, a productive, if informal, role, again, because of the great capabilities that, uh, that it offers. So that's what our focus is going to be. And whether it's testifying in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or talking privately with our friends in Beijing, we continue to underscore what America's national interests are, uh, how our policy has not changed, but how we uh, continue, uh, obviously, to have a deep interest, an abiding interest in uh, the maintenance of cross-strait peace and stability. Well, there's a, there's a lot more. I wish we could talk uh, more about Taiwan, but time is time is ticking. I would just say that it, it, it does seem, you know, someone who's watched this for a little bit, that it it's a lot easier nowadays to talk about Taiwan. It seems it's a lot easier to talk about Taiwan as a partner, uh, as as a uh, a country that that again plays a role in the Indo Pacific, a country that has, um, you know, its 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 own uh, important relations with other partners of ours, such as Japan. Uh, I know the the language I'm using is not the language necessarily that that the government would use, but um, but that that seems to be a change. It seems to be an extremely positive change. And you know, speaking as a historian, I think we're going to look back and we're going to we're going to be. I, I don't want to say surprised, but I think we'll be we'll be pleased as we look at the past decade, decade and a half, and see the the development. The big question is, of course, where does it go? And hopefully, in a way that that continues to to benefit Taiwan's 
stability and security, uh, which I think is how the government would put it, and others would would you know use different terms. So um, I'd love to talk more about it, but let's let's move on because we we do want to be respectful of your time. Um, let's talk about the Quad. I mean, you, you did you talked about sure. um, partnerships and you talked about yeah. um, you know dealing uh, both well first of all dealing with partners, friends, and allies, dealing with uh, countries that are not uh friends and allies but but with whom we have important relationships um the quad is going to be meeting next week president biden will be going may 24th in tokyo this will be the second meeting of uh the leaders uh live they did have a virtual meeting um but the world i think this is the third summit but the second in person third and the second in summit but the world's changed a lot um and events that have happened halfway around the world in Ukraine, I think, have had uh, a spillover effect to some degree into the Quad, certainly the thinking about what the Quad should be doing, the role the Quad should be playing in a world in which we we, we face aggression and uh, we face, uh, as you put before, the, the attempted use or the use of coercion. So first, can you give us a highlight? What's going to happen at the Quad? Um, is is the quad uh, are, are you know there's been some failures uh, in terms of vaccine diplomacy not not as much done as as we had hoped um, there's obviously splits now between three of the quad members and India over uh, relations with Russia because of Ukraine so can you give us a preview of what's going to happen and and more is the quad still viable well thank you Misha look. Um... I do know how pre- how excited the president is to travel to Tokyo on May 24 mm-hmm. for, uh, as you noted, the third uh, quad meeting, the second in-person summit. Uh, by our count, this is the third summit in the last 15 months. I, I think what I would say, Michelle, I, I think the quad is one of the most significant developments or uh, that I've seen in my career, or rather I should say maybe the, the further strengthening and expanding uh, and intensification of our cooperation and the, the cooperative activity activities we carry out together is probably one of the most significant developments that I've seen uh, in my career. Uh, I think that we're trying to demonstrate as, uh, as four leading democracies, four of the most capable democracies, that we as partners, allies, and democratic nations, that we can continue to deliver. Uh, deliver uh, in in defense of our uh, of our interests and our values, and deliver in terms of providing concrete and tangible outcomes uh, in the interest of all uh, across the region. So I, I think the the significance uh, of of this next meeting will be as before. It will be a chance for four democracies to discuss uh, the leading issues of the day. Uh, I, I will say, Misha, reflecting on uh, the foreign minister, the Quad Foreign Ministerial in Melbourne. Uh, that I mentioned earlier, that Secretary Blinken attended, and I accompanied him. I uh, I, I would I would differ uh, and quibble a bit with your uh, description of the Quad earlier, the, uh, because the phrase uh, that I use to describe the Quad, based on our interactions, uh, is is convergence. Uh, really, an amazing and I would argue unprecedented convergence of of interests and our outlooks on, on the region, how we see the region. Uh, what we think uh, are the greatest challenges that we face in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, also, conversely, what are the most important opportunities that we need to seize together? Uh, and based on those uh, discussions that uh, we've had, whether it's a leader level, foreign minister level, or in the, you know, the more expert level in the, the senior officials meetings that, uh, that I chair with my colleague Don Liu here periodically, it's, it's extraordinary how unified we are uh, on our approaches to the region, how we intend to work going forward. So I think the uh, the strategic conversations will be very important, but the, the quad leaders are also focused on making sure we achieve uh, tangible things. And, and I would say uh, the, the quad vaccine partnership uh, is actually one of, uh, I think the the best examples of, of the quad successfully working for the benefit, not just of our interests, but of the region as well. We've committed to deliver 1 billion vaccines uh, to the region. We're well on our way uh, to doing so. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I think we're about uh, halfway or beyond there. So I think that's been tremendous. But um, the other areas that you see you know, coming out uh, of the quad form ministerial you look at the joint statement that we released back in February, we're working on cybersecurity, cooperation to address climate change, critical and emerging technologies, 
infrastructure investment countering disinformation. Uh, we're also working to develop a quad uh, fellowship program. And, and maybe one other thing I can point out, Misha, that I think is quite significant, maybe hasn't gotten as much attention as I expected it, it would have. Last week, uh, President Biden hosted the US ASEAN Special Summit here in Washington, DC. It was a tremendous opportunity uh, to coordinate and advance practical cooperation with a, a, another very important set of partners. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, our, our nine partners who attended the summit from ASEAN. But if you look at that joint vision statement that we negotiated, um, the United States and ASEAN also highlighted the important work that we're doing uh, with other partners, including the Quad and specifically on the Quad Vaccine Partnership. So um, I think it goes to show that uh, both individually, the four countries of the Quad and the Quad as an entity uh, as well, we are absolutely and firmly committed to ASEAN centrality to cooperating with partners across the region, including in ASEAN, and again, in ways that deliver very practical benefits. So I think that's a general overview um, uh, of what the Quad leaders will be focused on. And I would anticipate that the White House and the President himself will have more to say about this in the next few days. But uh, truly, I, I can't underscore enough, I think, just how important and consequential uh, our cooperation in the, in the Quad is. Well, I'm, I'm glad you quibbled with me. We like quibbling. Quibbling, <laughs> quibbling is good, and and we appreciate the uh, no. But I, uh, I mean that down. sincerely. It's and if I think you can see it come through the joint vision statements, and you'll see it in the statements of the leaders. But having sat through the foreign ministerial in Melbourne, I sincerely have never seen anything quite like it. Just stunning, the extent to which again we are aligned and in which our interests and our, our views on the region converge. Uh, now, of course, we're, we're four independent sovereign nations and, and uh, there, there will be some issues, including the ones that you've, you've outlined on which we may have some differences. But uh, I think if you focus on uh, the Indo-Pacific, which, uh, which is where the Quad is working and where our primary focus in, is on, uh, again, I see a stunning convergence and alliance and uh, alignment. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. I'm, I, I'd like to see maybe if we can squeeze, you mentioned Southeast Asia and you were ambassador to yep. Vietnam. I'd like to squeeze in if we could. A final question about Vietnam. Vietnam is, is, uh, is a strategically critical country. Um, those Absolutely. of us who visited it understand the dynamism, its youth, its desire to play a larger role. But obviously we have, uh, it is a socialist republic. It, there are human rights issues. There are freedom of expression issues. And yet, if there's one country that you sort of hear over and over and over in the strategic discussions about the role that we hope it could play and that we could play with it, it's Vietnam. What is, what is your sense of where we're going to be going forward uh, with Vietnam? Well, Misha, thank you for asking about Vietnam. It's a subject about which I'm quite uh, passionate. Uh, I, 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 I agree with everything that you said. Uh, Vietnam, uh, our comprehensive partnership with Vietnam is vitally important to the United States. I would argue that Vietnam is one of our most important partners uh, in, in the entire region. We have such uh, incredible potential uh, going forward. Uh, you know, when, when I uh, reflect on on my time serving as, as American ambassador there, it truly was... Um, uh, an amazing honor to be there. And it was so moving to be there because uh, I always say that we have a future oriented partnership with Vietnam um, that is focused on uh, delivering results for our two countries' peoples. And I think we do that very well. And here's another place where we're largely aligned on how we see the region and what kind of region we want uh, to live in. But um, we also work on a daily basis to overcome some of the legacies uh, of our tragic past as well. And it's quite meaningful to me, quite moving to me that despite that tragic past and despite uh, having fought a brutal war against one another today, our work to overcome some of those uh, legacies, whether it's remediating unexploded ordnance or um, uh, dioxin and Agent Orange or treating people with disabilities or engaging in the humanitarian work to account for missing American service members and to account for Vietnam's own war dead. Those, those activities are deeply emotional, deeply uh, moving, and, and I think have helped contribute to this foundation of mutual and respect uh, and trust uh, on which our entire relationship is based today. Uh, and also, I, you know, if, if, you, if you go back and think about uh, our future together and our very positive present, um, uh, I think the Vietnamese are incredibly capable partners as well. Very strategic, very practical. 
I often joke they live in a rough neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I think their circumstances have forced them to be very clear strategic thinkers. Uh, what, what I have always underscored to my friends in Hanoi and across Vietnam is that they can count on the United States of America and count on our commitment to our partnership with Vietnam uh, and to our commitment to peace and stability across the Indo-Pacific. It's a message that we send, of course, to all of our friends and partners uh, across the region. But given my own experience there, uh, Vietnam will always be uh, you know, very special uh, to me personally. But you're, you're also right, one of our most important, most incapable part, uh, most capable partners. And, and I should hasten to add, really honored that the new Vietnamese Prime Minister Phan Minh Chin came to the US ASEAN summit and uh, he had a chance to uh, have a number of discussions with President Biden. Uh, I was privileged to attend as Secretary Blinken's uh, uh, meeting with him as well. Uh, I'm as optimistic as I've ever been about the future of our partnership with Vietnam as well. Well, in addition to being one of our most uh, accomplished diplomats, uh, ambassador to Vietnam, clearly one of the highlights, one of the milestones in the U.S.-Vietnam relationship was your Tet Rap. Yes. <laughs> yes. For those who I was who wondering don't if I know, could escape an interview without talking about the rap. cannot video. escape it. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to try to put some of that rap up on the podcast. Those of you who don't know, please go YouTube it. Um, that's the type of public diplomacy I think we need. Are you going to do, are you going to do any more rapping now that you're assistant secretary of state? I I think, Misha, I'm probably a one-hit wonder. Well, let me just say <laughs> something about that. That was so much fun to do. And, you know, I give all credit to my my team. Had a great colleague named Matt Ferentz, who was our public affairs officer at the time down in Ho Chi Minh City. And he conceived of the uh, the entire thing. And I was uh, I was merely the front person who was out there to, to make it go forward. But I think, um, I think it says a lot about the U.S.-Vietnam partnership that... Uh, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam at the time somehow thought it was a good idea uh, to do a rap video to celebrate the U.S.-Vietnam partnership at the time of the Tet holiday and that we thought it would play well. And then it did play well. And, oh, my gosh, did it exceed our expectations? And I think, you know, I was really moved by that. Um, I was surprised that anybody outside of Vietnam noticed. I still don't totally understand why it went viral for a while, but you may have some theories. But what I was most happy about is that I think our Vietnamese friends really appreciated it and really liked it because uh, I think they interpreted it for what it was, which was a, a signal of the great respect that we have for uh, Vietnamese people. And, and it says something about how far we've come, uh, you know, in, in the four plus decades since the Vietnam War, that's for sure. And, and one other point that I would say as well, isn't it extraordinary that we chose to use rap as the medium to convey that message? I was so struck to find that uh, rap is wildly popular in Vietnam today. The United States of America is wildly popular. So are all aspects of our culture, including culture associated with rap and hip hop. We were, um, you know, the whole, the whole video is a spoof uh, on the most popular, you know, rap battle show in Vietnam. And we got Wowie, who's Vietnam's most, probably most famous and popular rapper to join me in doing it. And so what I loved about it as well is that it, it celebrates something about, you know, the cultural links uh, between uh, the United States and Vietnam, and I think has opened up a whole new avenue for discussion. So my dream uh, would be, you know, now that COVID is opening up and we could travel, I would love to see us, you know, do something in this space. I would love to get some of America's, uh, you know, greatest rappers and hip art, hip hop artists to travel over there as well and vice versa. You know, my friend Wowie, who did that video with me, if I remember correctly, he told me he's never been to the United States. Oh, really? He, he loves the, loves the United States, loves American culture, obviously was inspired by rap culture, but has never been here. But uh, anyway, uh, really, it was, it was fun to do, but we did it for a very serious purpose. We did it uh, to try to celebrate uh, our relationship, convey respect uh, to the Vietnamese. But I have to say the response far exceeded our, our expectations. But I think, um, yeah, I think I'm a one hit wonder uh, in that regard. I'll see if my uh, public diplomacy colleagues have any more bright ideas for me in the region, but probably won't be rapping too much uh, anymore uh, anytime soon. No, oh, that that's that's great. Clearly, uh, it shows your your you know your your touch, your human touch out there, but as well in, in spending time with us today to go through all of this. Uh, again, a busy time, new leadership, uh, top level meetings, summits coming up uh, as, as we speak. Uh, a, a full plate for you and your colleagues, um, uh, and uh, I think a lot of movement. Uh, you know, still lots of concern over over way things are developing in in certain areas. 
um, sure. but but really um, the 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 commitments uh, seem to be um, you know building on one another in in a way that uh, we're all you know waiting, watching, looking for capstone documents to understand uh, all of the clarity of thinking. Um, but clearly, your your ability to explain it all to us is is extremely helpful and cover a lot of areas we usually don't get to on the podcast. So, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Dan Crittenbrink. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Pacific Century. Misha, thank you. What an honor to spend time with you. Really impressed by um, uh, your questions. Really enjoyed our conversation. And again, um, I am very optimistic about our future in the Indo-Pacific, but we shouldn't underestimate uh, the scope of the challenges that we face uh, either. Uh, but to those who uh, sometimes question uh, our commitment and focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific, I would simply say one small example look at the fact that Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, spent a week in the Indo-Pacific in Australia and Fiji and in Hawaii meeting with our Japanese and Korean allies right on the eve of Russia's unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and, and despite uh, the challenge posed uh, by the war in Ukraine and uh, Russia's ongoing brutality against the Russian people, you see the fact that the president hosted the U.S. ASEAN summit here in Washington last week that he'll be in in Japan and Korea in the coming week. And I think it shows we are going to remain laser focused on the Indo-Pacific uh, going forward. Well, again, uh, a, a great summation and we appreciate it. Uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Dan Crittenbrink. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who've been listening, thank you. This is Misha Oslin, and we'll see you next time on the Pacific Century. Misha, thanks so much. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.